Okay, we're going to look at some hydrogen bonding. Um, this is part of the uh, alcohols topic, and um, hydrogen bonding is something which we need to use in order to explain uh, something that we see with alcohols. So, um, if you look at the graph, you can see that we have uh, the alkanes. The alkanes um, have at their boiling points uh, graphed like this according to the number of carbons, and you can see that we've got a pattern which goes um, upwards like that. Now. We know that that's because there are intermolecular forces or London forces um, and the, the longer the chain um, we have uh, more London forces. So what happens when we look at the same pattern in the alcohols? Well what happens is we find that we sh end up plotting them somewhere completely different. Uh, roughly about here like that. Okay, uh, now this gives us a little bit of a puzzle because we know that the larger the relative mass, the um, higher the boiling point, um, because the larger the relative mass, the more electrons, the more electrons, the more the London, uh, the greater the London forces, the larger the London forces, the uh, harder it is to separate molecules. So. Um, this isn't. Uh, this is basically saying that alcohols have um, greater um, forces in between them, but they're not actually London forces, and we know that because actually, if we take halo alkanes, um, which have a greater relative mass than the alcohols, we actually find out um, that the pattern is somewhere around here. Okay, so there's something else going on. Our alkanes and our halo alkanes may only have London forces between them, but the alcohols are stronger than you'd expect from a London force, so there must be something else. So, um, that leads us to wondering, what is it about the alcohols? Now, if you draw the skeletal formula of um, some of the alkanes, and then you try do the same for the alcohols, you'll see that there's only really one difference and that is that we have an OH group on the end so this boiling point change must be something to do with the OH group now we can see this in other compounds as well here's some examples um, these are all inorganic compounds but you can see that if we have um, tin hydride, um, silicon hydride, germanium hydride, and um, carbon hydride, or methane, as we, could, as we know it, um, then we see that we have a pattern here. We have a pattern of boiling points again, which is nice and easy to see. We can predict, uh, using that, where we would expect to find hydrides either side, if, we, if there were any down here, or if we discovered some new ones up here. And that's a pattern, and we like patterns. Patterns help us explain things. So, the problem comes when we look at the other groups. That was group four. We would expect um, group five to behave the same, but it doesn't. Here we have the, um, uh, the three in group five. Uh, we would expect, if we extrapolated now, that we would find the next one down here. But actually, in reality, uh, NH3, which is ammonia, has a boiling point more about here. So this is another example of where we have um, something bonded to a hydrogen where it's not following the expected uh, pattern. We have a boiling point which is much higher and we conclude that it is something to do with this hydrogen um, bonded onto a certain other elements because if we do the same with group 6 we find that if we follow the pattern there roughly we might expect water's boiling point to be down here somewhere but again it's not water's boiling point is up here and so again it doesn't fit the same 
ideas, which doesn't sit the pa fit the same pattern as um, group um, four, and it's the same with fluorine as well. HF should be somewhere down here, but it isn't. It's actually up here. So that tells us that something weird is going on when we have a hydrogen joined to those three elements. Carbon seems to fit the pattern, but these three elements seem to not fit the pattern. There must be something odd going on. Let's take a look at them. So we have um, the ones that we're interested in are nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. And we can see from the periodic table that we have, they are over on this side of the periodic table and they are at the top. Now that's important because um, we know that if you are over to the right hand side of the periodic table and near the top, you have a lot of a property called electronegativity. Now the noble gases don't have this because they are unreactive, they are inert. So if we ignore them, we have three very, very uh, electronegative, um, in this, in this, fluorine is the most electronegative element in the periodic table. And what that means is that when we have a um, bond which has hydrogen, which is not very electronegative, and one of these elements, we get a polar bond. So what's happening here is in our covalent bond, we're sharing a pair of electrons and the oxygen is a uh, nucleus is attracting them and so is the hydrogen nucleus. But in this case, because this is more electronegative, the electrons are drawn towards the oxygen. That gives us a very slight negative charge. And it also gives on the hydrogen, which has lost, um, well, it's not lost the electrons, but they have moved closer to the ocean. That gives us a slightly positive charge. And so what that means is that if I take two molecules, um, which have a delta plus and a delta minus, um, like this, and I put them together, we actually have a delta minus on this one, and a delta plus on that one. And the same on this one. And so what that means is that we have an attraction between here and here, but there's a bit more to it than that. Because if we look at the structure of um, the things which have this high bonding point, we notice something else. If you look over here, and this structure, you can see that there are two lone pairs of electrons. So these are pairs of electrons not involved in bonding, but they are on the outer shell. So let's have a look at the three that we've got here. We have um, water and we have methane and we have ammonia. And the hydrogen bonding that we get is in ammonia and water and it's due to the lone pair here and the lone pairs here. Now, if we compare these molecules very quickly, um, we have the strongly electronegative um, part I'm gonna do here in red, which is the oxygen, and here is the nitrogen. And in carbon, they're both the same electronegativity, so they are both um, uh, pulling the electrons with the same amount of um, force, and so therefore this is a non-polar bond. And if I put a delta positive here, delta positive here, it doesn't actually matter which hydrogen this is on. Okay, then we can see that we have two molecules which are polar. It is a dipole um, here, so negative and positive, which will attract other dipoles. But also we have some lone pairs of electrons, and it's very important when you're drawing this to put the lone pairs of electrons in.